Hello, everyone, and welcome to this second episode of this year's Discover Molecular Interactions webinar series. My name is Vivian, and I am responsible for scientific communication at Dynamic Biosensors, and I will be your host today. So each month we focus on a different molecular interaction and we discuss its challenges and also present essays to analyze it. However, this month is a bit different because today we will focus on sample preparation. So our technology to measure molecule-molecule interactions, switch sense, uh, requires your protein to be gated to a short DNA strand. But these DNA protein conjugates are not only relevant for switch sense users, but also in many different areas, for example, DNA nanotechnologies and antibody detection and even antiviral therapies. So today I'm joined by my colleague Sabrina from our company site in Boston. Hi, Sabrina. Welcome. Hi, Vivian. Hi, everyone. Thank you for having me. And Sabrina is our product specialist for the Profire, our instrument for conjugate purification. And she has accumulated a wealth of experience in conjugation and purification. And I'm very happy that she will share all her knowledge today with you. So if you have any questions during the talk, please feel free to use the Q&A feed. Or if you can't see that, you can, of course, also use the normal chat function. And we will answer all your questions afterwards in the Q&A session. And then you can, of course, also raise your virtual hand and I can unmute you and we can discuss directly. And now, without any further ado, I will hand over to you, Sabrina, and I am looking forward to your talk. Yeah, thank you. So again, thanks for inviting me for the session and thank you everyone for joining. I'm super excited to share a bit of, um, well, my knowledge and um, information about the profile. So, oops. Yeah, it's going to be about the effortless conjugation preparation, um, purification and analysis of samples using our profile technology. And the first question is, why are we so interested in protein DNA conjugates? And it's really easy to answer because those conjugates have become immensely popular over a huge field of um, different research um, sections where these conjugates have proven to be very useful because they bring together DNA, which offers um, a super easy platform to um, engineer whatever sequence you want to use. So it brings a huge flexibility and um, you can, yeah, literally have this, any sequence of your dreams synthesized for a really small amount of money by now. And if you combine those with proteins, you have also the specificity and the unique binding behaviors of the proteins. And those two brought together offers um, a wide range of applications in biomedical research, for example, where it can be used to locate DNA modifying enzymes or also to have any kind of DNA-based readout. For example, if you do spatial phenotyping where you stain a tissue with um, labeled or fluorescent protein that you can then read out site-specifically, or if you do immune PCRs. And of course, another really big, big field um, that we're also gonna see an example from later is DNA nanotechnology. So people have started to create and synthesize the most impressive structures in 3D shapes with um, DNA strands and origami strands. But of course, sometimes um, you want to add some protein functionality to these um, constructs because that allows you to bind them together or to bind them to specific target cells or um, other proteins. You can connect them further, you can immobilize them and so on. So adding proteins um, functionality to these constructs can be really helpful and open up um, even more possibilities to use these um, nanostructures. And speaking from our own experience, um, coming from molecular interaction analysis on our SwitchSense platform, we also regularly use um, DNA protein conjugates to immobilize any molecule of interest on our biochip surfaces and then have the opportunity to read out binding behaviors and any molecular interactions, thanks to that um, DNA kind of keeping the molecule in place for the readout. But there's also other biosensor applications and microarrays that use similar technologies and um, also other examples are proximity ligation or extension, extension assays that are all based on the DNA strands coming together. 
So what can the profiler do for you in a DNA conjugate workflow? Um, the nice thing about the profiler is that it does not only give you an instrument that is a, both a purifier and an analyzer in one, um, so you can inject your samples and it will give you pure results and also help you analyze the chromatograms. But we really wanted to make this more than just another instrument, but really a unique purification system by also offering you optimized and um, consistent and reliable coupling methods that you can implement in your workflow as well. But of course, the profile can also be used with any other coupling method and samples gained from different chemistries. The workflow is a simple two-step workflow, so you can uh, use um, either one of our coupling kits. As mentioned, they are optimized for the use with the profile and thus give you um, very reliable and um, easy to use results. And it's very intuitive and standardized uh, protocols that you would follow. But again, you can also work with samples that have been prepared with any other coupling um, or conjugation um, chemistry or strategy. And the second step is then, as mentioned, injecting your sample into the profile instrument, purifying it through ion exchange chromatography, and then receiving your pure sample and also an option to automatically analyze the amounts that you um, gained from that purification. And let's take a bit of a closer look to the first step, which is the coupling reaction, so more the chemistry and not yet the use of the instrument. And um, from our kits, we offer different methods that can be used to um, functionalize your DNA and then attach it to your protein or antibody of interest. So you usually in our kits start with a oligo strand. It can be anything from 10 to about 150 base pairs. And this is also usually what I observed in the field being the range that people like to work with. You would functionalize or activate this oligo with a cross-linking molecule. And that cross-linking molecule in the most standard case has a reactive group able to react with an amine group. The good thing about amines and which is pretty much the reason why amine coupling has become like the go to coupling strategy um, in the field is that pretty much every protein has at least one or multiple amine groups. So you don't have to modify your protein before conjugating, conjugating it or being able to conjugate it, which is also usually very useful because not everyone has um, the opportunity and the resources to bioengineer proteins specifically. So this can literally be used on any protein right off the bat, um, the way you can just purchase or find it. And um, we also offer other strategies though too. For example, this is an example of thiol coupling, where instead of using an amine group on a protein, we target um, a thiol group. Unfortunately, thiols are not as common as amine groups, but they can still be found in a wide range of proteins. And since they're less common, they're a bit more specific, which can definitely also have advantages for coupling strategies. And another option that we offer is um, click chemistry or other customized coupling chemistries, depending on your needs. So once you choose from any of either the coupling chemistries and options offered by us or other companies or your own established protocols, you will have your coupling reaction mix. But of course your coupling reaction mix after putting everything together and incubating it according to the protocol will contain all the components. So it will contain DNA, it will contain um, free protein that didn't conjugate and it will contain your conjugate. And of course the goal is to free these samples of all the unconjugated DNA and also of all the unconjugated protein and leave you with only your pure concentrated conjugate sample. And the profiler does exactly that. You inject your coupling mix and after a 30 minute run um, that is fully automated where you have to do nothing but inject the sample in the beginning, you will be able to retrieve your purified sample and you can then afterwards also concentrate and buffer exchange it and you will have your conjugate stock solution that you can then use for any of your follow-up essays and applications. I wanted to show you some examples what that would look like in the profile. This is a ubiquitin sample. This is a rather small protein with eight kilodaltons. Um, and you can see from the elution profile, so the first peak is the conjugate peak, 
um, that has your one-to-one -one conjugate between DNA, oligo, and protein. And then the second peak is the unconjugated DNA. What you cannot see in this specific image is uh, the free protein that always eludes all the way in the beginning, so on the left. But uh, later on, I'll also show you a picture where you can see the full um, chromatogram better. Um, and yes, yeah, since ubiquitin is rather small, and this is ion exchange, it runs relatively close to the free DNA, but the peaks are still nicely separable, even in this example. If we choose a protein that's slightly bigger, in this case, it's a thrombine, as example, 36 kilodaltons, you can see that already the elution profile changes and the protein conjugate elutes earlier than in the previous example, which makes the separation and really the purification and um, uh, even better because it really makes sure that there's no free DNA overlapping with the conjugate sample. And last but not least, because of course antibodies are of immense um, interest in, in all kinds of immunotherapies and medical biomedical research, I also um, wanted to show an antibody example. This is golimumab, 150 kilodaltons. And again, since the size and the charge um, affect the elution profile, these peaks elude even earlier and are even nicely separated from the free DNA. Um, let's take a bit of a closer look. As mentioned, now you can also see the free protein peak in the left of the image. Um, and what is interesting about this antibody, but also something we see in a lot of antibodies, is that the free protein and also the conjugate doesn't just give you one peak, but it gives you two distinct uh, peaks that are kind of mirrored. And there is two theories, and depending on the protein, this is either um, mono and um, bi-labeled, conjugates. So the first peak could be really one part of the molecule and one part of DNA. And the second peak could be one part of molecule, protein or antibody, and two or more strands of DNA. Because as mentioned, if you use amine coupling, you usually have several attachment sites. What is another alternative explanation, especially for antibodies, is that we could also see um, the whole unit and a subunit, so maybe just one arm, because a lot of um, antibody solutions are not homogeneous, really. They might have a full construct in there, but also maybe at some point there was just aggregation or the arms kind of separated. And you might see that actually one of the conjugates is just the whole antibody with DNA, and the second conjugate peak might be just the subfraction of the antibody with DNA. But this is something that could be further analyzed, for example, on a gel if this is of interest. Um, and one example that is a bit more specific that I just wanted to briefly mention is um, we also offer amine coupling in a more site-selective way because for a lot of follow-up assays, especially if you look into binding behaviors, it might be relevant in which direction your protein or antibody has been conjugated. So you might want the binding site to be fully accessible on a specific site of the conjugate construct. And this way, um, you might need a conjugation chemistry that allows you to navigate this a bit more. And we offer one solution that we call the HIS-mediate amine coupling. And what we do is we basically utilize a HIS tag during the process of conjugation to orient the protein with the HIS tag in a specific way, so that then in the next step, the amine coupling can happen on a more defined location of the protein and can thus give you conjugate results that also follow that um, orientation. Because usually in all these his tagged um, proteins, the specific location of the his tag is known. So in this case, we again have the oligo with the crosslinker, but we also have a so-called guiding DNA that can find and bind um, the his tag of the protein through tris NTA reaction. And then due to the proximity, the, AVA, uh, the amine coupling and the covalent bond of the amine coupling reaction happens in a more specific location. The workflow is pretty similar to all the other protocols. It just involves a, an additional step where actually the protein of interest with the histag is incubated with the guiding DNA first. And as in all the other proteins, the DNA strand that we actually want to conjugate to the molecule, uh, molecule sorry, um, is incubated with the crosslinker. We bring these two together as seen in the previous image to initiate the amine coupling reaction. And then the only thing we have to do in addition is we want to remove that additional guiding DNA um, strand because of course we don't want that attached to our construct. 
And then afterwards, just like with the other strategies, you would inject your sample into the profile and you will be able to receive your conjugate peak. But in this case, you would know that it is a more specific um, geom geometry or direction of conjugation. And now in the second half of the webinar, I would like to um, show you some examples because now it was a lot of theory just about the chemistries and the instrument itself. And I think it's always really nice to see some examples where some of our customers have actually used these DNA protein conjugates in their follow-up assays. Um, this first as, um, example is a point of care detection of bispecific antibodies where antigen conjugated nuclear sorry, nucleic acid strands um, were used to detect these antibodies. And the goal of the authors was to, a lot of technologies or assays that help to detect bispecific antibodies or antibodies in general are, they're really great, they are super specific, they um, can give great results, but usually they require quite complex technology, even like our own biosensors. You need a lot of equipment and you need very, prepared samples. And of course, if you want to screen a larger amount of patient samples in a quicker and more reliable way, you are looking for methods where the same kind of reliable detection can happen, again, in a more point of care way and in an easier and faster approach. And this is what this group focused on. It's um, a group um, led by Francesco Ricci at the University of Tor Vergata in Rome. And they basically developed a platform where they allowed these bispecific antibodies to be detected in a easier and quicker way. And one of the um, samples they used was an EGFR DNA conjugate that they prepared, um, I think even with one of our conjugation kits and then purified with the profile. And they used these DNA protein constructs to bind the bispecific antibodies and to allow a fluorescent readout that would then detect the presence of this specific antibody. And they used two different approaches, which I think is just interesting to see because it shows really nicely the, the uh, versatility and programmability of these conjugates. One example was that they used uh, the EGFR conjugate to bind one arm, arm of the antibody and um, a peptide conjugate to bind the other arm of the antibody. And both of these were um, hybridized with another DNA strand, and if brought together with both the antibody and a reporter strand, the reporter strand would basically be removed or displaced by the other strands. The reporter strand is fluorescent, so as soon as the whole construct comes together, the reporter strand is being excluded and can then be read out through any fluorescent detection method. And the second approach, where they used almost the same uh, conjugates just slightly altering the DNA strand used. They um, had a reporter module that had one conjugate and an input module and only if these two came together with the bispecific antibody they would activate a fluorophore that is part of the reporter module and would again allow a fluorescent readout only in the presence of that very specific um, antibody and thus allowing really the detection based on specific binding. Um, and again, this is a nice example, I think, because it shows that by just um, using different DNA strands, you really take full advantage of the versatility and the programmability of um, DNA oligoconjugates. Another example is from Dr. Lundegren at the Uppsala University in Sweden. They use nanobodies instead of antibodies, so really a lot smaller proportions of antibodies instead of the whole construct. And in this very specific sample, they wanted to show that these nanobodies could also be used in an affinity-based amino acid, again, for protein detection. And they argued that instead of having the whole construct of antibody, that might not be as specifically conjugated or also not binding as specifically and might have more unspecific binding, the nanobodies might offer an advantage to these full constructs. So they try to show that both nanobody and um, full antibody immune assays gave similar results. So they conjugated again, different nanobodies and different oligos, but all in the same approach, again, really using that versatility and flexibility. 
Um, and they used a slightly different conjugation approach, um, which is a site-specific sortase mediated ligation. So they basically had a little tag in their original strand on the nanobody, and this tag was then um, detected and removed and replaced by the actual oligo through the sortase, which I think is really neat to see um, another example aside from standard amide coupling. But again, they also used the profile to then afterwards purify the samples, which shows, as mentioned in the beginning, that you can, of course, use all kinds of different methods and still utilize the profile for the purification. And um, they used proximity extension assays, which um, is basically the idea of bringing together two binders and the protein of interest and thus two DNA strands that are attached to the binding molecules, it will cause a DNA extension reaction and that extension can be um, amplified and read out in the qPCR. And as you can see below, both the nanobody-based um, PEA assay and the antibody-based PEA assay gave very similar results, thus proving their point that nanobodies can be a nice alternative to use in these assays. A slightly different um, example, but really nice because it involves origamis, and origamis have been of huge interest all over the fields in the recent years, is from Dr. Hendrik Dietz um, at the TU in Munich. And they did something really interesting because they utilized an origami construct modified with four different antibody binding sites or antibodies attached to it um, through the conjugates to basically look into ways to decrease on-target off-tumor toxicity. Because what a side effect that is being seen in a lot of immunotherapy approaches is that, especially if T cells, for example, are engaged or other immunotherapeutic binders, really often they have on-target specificity, but they also have off-target or off-tumor toxicity. So instead of just attacking or aiming at tumor cells, they might also aim at um, healthy tissue or healthy cells that do have a similar receptor or binder available. And of course, this is a side effect that is not wanted in any immunotherapeutic approaches. So this paper is a really nice example where these origamis were um, used as carriers and these four attachment sites, two on each side, were created to um, allow attachment of effector cell-specific antibodies on the one side. So in this case, they used mostly antibodies that would bind and recruit T cells. And on the other side of the carrier um, construct, they added antibodies that would be specific to the target cell. And thus, they would basically bring the T cell on the one side and the target cell on the other side in close proximity and in like direct positioning to each other and thus allow more specific, um, well, I'll call it attacking of the T cell to the tumor cell and less off target and off tumor effects of these um, T cells. Um, they call it programmable T cell engagers because these binding sites can be easily adapted to any um, effector cell and any target cell by just replacing these antibody conjugates on these attachment sites. And again, also um, this group used the profile to purify the conjugates. And I think it is a really neat example for origami um, nanotechnology. And I have one last example that I personally like a lot. It's one of my favorites, which is from a um, company in Munich called Capsitech. Um, and I think this used to be um, a master's thesis also for a student at the um, TU in Munich. Um, they designed little origami shells and they use them to trap viruses. And they do this by basically having on the inside of these shells little DNA tags. And those DNA tags can again bind DNA antibody um, conjugates and thus allows this construct to be lined on the inside with a bunch of these um, virus specific binding um, antibodies. And thus, they can capture the virus within these little shells because both of these uh, shells will then attach to the surface of the virus. And um, also, in their case, they used um, the profile and our coupling method methods to create these attachable um, DNA 
virus antibody um, conjugates. And you can see a little picture here. It's not super clear. On the left, you can see one of the shells. In the middle, you have a virus. And on the right side, you have the other half of the shell. And of course, if we attach these structures to all kinds of different viruses, these viruses are inhibited in their normal viral behavior. They might, for example, not be able to enter the cell normally as they would have to in order to infect the host. And I think this is just such a cool example um, of how nanotechnology and conjugates can be brought together to create a unique approach. And I think they proved that this was easily adaptable again by just changing the conjugates on the inside of the traps and based on specific conjugates specific to different viruses, they were able to trap influenza viruses, but also other kinds of viruses and showed that by exchanging these conjugates on the inside of the trap, these traps can be easily adjusted to a whole different and big variety of, yeah, different viruses. Um, and yeah, with this really cool and unique example, I would already like to come to the end of this. And um, thank you everyone for your attention and would like to open the floor for any questions. Thank you so much, Sabrina, for sharing your insights into uh, purification with us. Um, yeah, as you already mentioned, feel free to ask any questions and um, you can post them either in the chat or in the Q&A feed or ask us directly. I can also unmute you. So let's start with a first question from the Q&A feed. Um, you already mentioned uh, when you talked about the antibodies, the problem with single labeled and multi labeled samples, uh, can you distinguish this in the chromatogram or can you also collect these these um, uh, compositions separately? Mm -hmm. Yeah, so as in most cases for these purifications, the results are very dependent on the protein or antibody use. So this is usually the factor that determines the whole purification process. But as shown in this antibody example, but also we've seen other examples, um, if there are multiple amine groups amongst the protein and the protein is not too small in size, you're usually able to see multiple peaks, conjugate peaks. And we know from experience that whatever peak eludes all the way in the beginning. So the peak that is least negatively charged by the least amount of DNA present is usually the one-to-one -one conjugates. And if you see more um, conjugate peaks before the free DNA eludes, then this is usually double labeled or even triple labeled ones. But again, depending on the protein, the visibility of this depends a bit on the charge of the protein. But as long as they're nicely visible, you can definitely also collect them separately um, from the profile from the different fractions by just picking the fractions more um, reduced in a more reduced way and really just picking the fractions where the peak appears. And we've had multiple examples where this was used also to really compare the multi-labeled versus the single labeled conjugates um, and to see if this gives you similar results or different results. So yeah, it's definitely for most of the proteins, if multi-labeled conjugation appears, this also depends a little on the ratio of protein to DNA that you use during the conjugation. But if the ratio allows it and if the protein, um, the amount of amine groups in the protein allows it, then really often it is visible and can also be separated then. Mm -hmm. Thank you. Um, a more technical question next. Uh, do we use size exclusion columns or ion exchange columns? We use ion exchange columns. So it's, of course, the size always plays into the illusion and purification as well, because usually, well, the bigger the protein, the more neutrally charged it usually is. So that you saw that in these examples that the bigger molecules eluded earlier, which is just that the added DNA changes the charge less to the negative than if the molecule already is smaller and the charge, the added negative charge of a DNA strand really moves it closer to the free DNA. But it's definitely um, a ion exchange reaction. Mm -hmm. And uh, how much optimization would you say is needed to determine these optimal parameters to get different protein DNA conjugations? You mean in terms of the ratios of the conjugates? Um, it, so, for example, if you use our conjugation kits, we always give a well-established 
suggestion um, of amounts that we usually use where we know from experience that they give really good results for most of the cases. And in most cases, the biggest influence is really um, adjusting the ratio between DNA and um, protein. Again, if you're more interested in single labeled conjugates, you should definitely aim for more of a one to one ratio between the two components. If you actually want to favor multi-label, you can use more DNA, more two to one or three to one or even higher. And in general, I think it only requires like maybe a couple of runs, maybe two or three runs where you can easily change the amount, for example, of the protein and you will immediately in the profile see a difference to your previous run because the profile, one of the nice features is that um, we know from our internal tests that um, the results are very reproducible. So if you use always the same amount of sample, the conjugate at uh, the chromatogram will look pretty much the same in every run. So the moment you adjust one component, you will immediately see an effect and thus have a really nice R&D response visible in the profile. I think that's also the one of the main advantages of the profile, right? That there's like the whole experience of our team went into like the setup. So that's like yeah. what you what you get. Exactly. Yeah. We get the question often, what's the difference between the profile and for example and another um HPLC or ion exchange um chromatographic system? And yeah, it's really that. A lot of these systems do not provide any programs, any salt gradients that you need or any like illusion profile uh, or programs yet. And we poured all that R&D time already in and we provide the programs um, that you can immediately use for any DNA from length 10 base pairs to 100 base pairs. You just enter the length of the DNA. And in really most cases, the fit of the program is good enough to collect conjugate right off the bat without any adjustments and even if you want some adjustments it's usually just a few clicks and you can um, customize the programs even further um, and tailor them really to your samples but the standard programs are a little bit of a one-size-fits-all approach we really made sure with lots of internal testing that um, they fit well for a wide range of dna and protein combinations mm -hmm. Um, could you maybe comment on minimal requirements for the the purification, like the minimal volume we need, concentrations, mm -hmm. things like that? Yeah, so the injection volume is 160 microliters usually, which most of the standard um, amine coupling reactions, for example, are anyways a bit lower. Even if you have higher amounts, there is um, the possibility to also customize the instrument a little in increasing the volume of the sample loop. We've also done that for a couple of customers, but usually the standard amount is 160 microliters. And the detection volume or the detection limit of the detector unit in the system is super low, so it can detect even drifts between buffers. So really the smallest amount of sample will be visible. So in terms of really detecting it, um, you maybe um, notice it in the, I might even go back in the example here um, from this customer, the units are only like two units high, which is considered really, really low, but you can still detect the peaks. So it depends more on the output you will need for your follow-up assays. So depending on how much you need, this is what you would inject, but the profile detection itself is sensitive enough to detect even very small amounts of just a couple of nanomolar or even less. Mm -hmm. And uh, we can stick to the, the output, actually, because there are a couple of questions about that. Uh, first of all, whether the sample is diluted after the purification and you need to concentrate it for the downstream assays. Yeah, so the profile gives you 12 fractions at the end of each run. And depending on how your um, sample is looted, like in this case, your conjugate would be in fraction 10, 11, and 12. So you would pick these fractions. Each of the fractions in the standard protocols, um, sorry, programs has about 600 to 700 microliters. So your sample would definitely be diluted down um, a certain degree. And what's usually more concerning, I'd say, after the run um, than uh, the concentration or the dilution factor is that, of course, we use a salt gradient and a lot of the proteins would not like to be kept in the high salt mix that they are being eluded from. So it's definitely recommended, um, but also in any other um, elution method, I think, to do a buffer exchange at the end and always use 
kind of buffer that your protein is most happy in. Um, and just exchange it at the end. That way you can also concentrate, maybe set the concentration already to the amount that you need for your follow-up assays, store it away at minus 80 or so. So it's definitely a little bit of after purification hands-on, but it's usually about like half an hour or so. And can you also give an estimation of the amount of antibody oligoconjugate we can achieve with the instrument and like the volume of sample we can handle? Mm -hmm. So again, the minimum amount is really, really low, just maybe like a nanomolar or even less. The maximum amount, I think we've pushed the standard column to about a milligram, I would say, in sample. Um, this is still nicely detectable. So even if you have um, a more of a high throughput approach or you really need large amounts of samples. We have run conjugates with up to one or even two milligrams of antibody used during the conjugation and they were still nicely detectable and anyways collectible, just higher concentrated, of course. Um, so this is definitely in both directions a range that um, is super common. Um, a milligram is already more on the higher side, but it's still possible. And we've even, as mentioned, played with bigger sample loops. If the volume is a bit limiting and you have a lot more than these 160 microliters and you have like a whole milliliter and you don't want to do split up injections and runs, you can also adjust the loop and just inject a whole milliliter right away. So all of this still works. And we've even, I think, run a couple of small tests where we used a bigger column that allowed even more sample, but it's not as well tested as the standard column, I'd say. Mm -hmm. And would you say we lose conjugates due to the purification during this process? So usually, I mean, the question if you lose conjugate in the instrument is kind of, of course, hard to answer because no one really determines how much conjugate is in the mix before, mm -hmm. but we definitely um, see a very consistent um, amount. And we also always calculate the concentration and the yield at the end of the runs. And they definitely range in the standard ranges where um, the literature also is located in terms of how efficient, for example, amine coupling is. Um, and we've never really observed any sample loss. So all the sample you enter into the system, free DNA, free protein and conjugate will come off again, unless in very rare cases, you might have some sticky proteins that might be a bit tighter attached to the column material. Um, but this can easily be tested and resolved with just a, a wash run after the normal run. And if you still see peaks coming off, you would know that your sample is more sticky. But I've, I haven't seen this really often. And um, in most cases, we assume that since we drive the salt gradient also all the way up to one molar, we really rinse off the column at the end of the run and everything that comes off would be visible in the chromatograms. So the retention is should be complete. Mm -hmm. uh, there's another question in that direction, but I'm not sure if I understand it correctly. So maybe you can also clarify your question if I don't. Uh, understand it, but it's about the yield, whether we get an accurate concentration of the conjugate product. Mm -hmm. So um, as you saw in these, maybe um, you can see it also here in this example, actually. So what the anal analysis does, I haven't actually really yeah, I've talked about this too in too much detail, but the software at the end, um, after your run finishes, will um, run an analysis and you can see the analysis here you have the red line that is the raw signal so really what the detector measured and then based off the free dna eluding at the end in fraction 13 the software can fit two peaks um in visible here in like blue and orange and then um based on the fit of these orange and blue peaks it will calculate um, both an amount in picomole that um, would be expected in this if you collect the whole peak and also concentration. But of course, uh, the concentration will be based on the total volume of all the fractions. And thus, if you do a concentration, a buffer exchange afterwards, the volume will change. And of course, the concentration will be a lot higher actually than calculated here. But if you would use one of these fractions really in that manner and you would pool them and use the solution directly, then also the concentration value that he calculates here, for example, 90 nanomolar would be very precise. Um, 
we internally always do a cross calculations also of these picomole and concentration values afterwards. And they are really um, super precise as long as the fit is good. If you have very um, weirdly shaped peaks or the fit is not as neat, then of course your calculation will not be as precise, but it's still usually in a pretty neat ballpark, I'd say. Um, did we ever uh, try or some one of our customers ever conjugated membrane proteins? Do you know any examples for that? Um, I'm not. So is this meant in a way that they are in their full shape still or really just the isolated protein? Because I think if it's an isolated, I mean, is it really like a funnel or I'm not entirely sure, but I think in theory, um, the I don't know an exact example, but as long as it can be conjugated and it's not bigger than, yeah, we give a range of like up to 500 kilodaltons, then it could definitely still be um, purified with the profile. Conjugation wise, I don't think I have an exact example right now, but um, we could always, of course, look it up and see if it has been done. Yeah. We can we can get back to you and figure out whether we can find an example in our in our library for sure. Um, okay, then there's another question. Um, when we are targeting conjugates containing multiple oligos per protein, could we have the case where the free oligo peak overlaps with one of the conjugate peaks? Can we address this problem? So we definitely expect that a certain amount of oligos will at some point start blending into the free oligo peak. So at some point that, again, based on the size of the, um, the protein, we definitely expect that in a free DNA peak, there might be some remainders of um, very high labeled um, protein based on um, just the availability of amine sites on the protein. There would be a way to further resolve it if you would um, take some time to adjust the gradient and maybe flatten the gradient and that way kind of pull the peaks apart a little. That would definitely be an option. It always depends on um, the need afterwards. I think most of our customers are usually focusing and interested in the one-to-one -one conjugates. Um, and yeah, again, you could try to resolve the peak further, but there's definitely um, just a limitation to the column at some point as to how um, well resolved um, the peaks are, the higher the multi-labeling is. But up to, I think two, like double or triple labeled um, can be resolved usually as long as it's happening in present based on the ratios. Mm -hmm. And for the single and double labeling, there's a follow-up for the concentration calculation. So let's uh, finish the session with uh, this follow-up question. Um, do we take the single and double labeling into account when, concentra when calculating the concentration, since concentration of DNA and of protein could be different in these cases? Yeah, so one big challenge, not for the profile, but really for the whole field of DNA protein conjugates is the concentration determination afterwards, because unfortunately no one has yet developed any methods where you can really um, measure both components in a reliable way or really measure the DNA protein conjugate concentration. You always afterwards have to settle for either measuring your DNA amount or your protein amount. If we go for a single labeled peak, of course, we would expect that if I measure the um, DNA amount, I have only one-to-one -one conjugates in that purified peak, right? So I would expect that any DNA I measure in this peak has one protein attached to it. So for example, for our switch sense applications, this is um, the value we go for. We measure just the DNA, but we also usually only go for the single labeled peaks. If you go for the multi-labeled peaks, it might be a good idea instead of to measure the DNA absorption afterwards and determining the concentration via um, DNA. Maybe it would be better to uh, determine the concentration through analyzing the protein amount and measuring the protein amount. Um, and if you really want to know 
which constant, uh, which labeling degrees you find in a specific peak. It's also sometimes recommended to just maybe run a gel and stain it accordingly and see if really the DNA amount is double or triple. And then you can use these values together to establish a reliable concentration of your sample usually. Okay. Um... We are already out of time. Thank you all so much for the, all your questions and the lively discussion. Thank you, Sabrina, for your talk and the, and the Q&A. Thank um, you for having me. Thank you all for, for joining and stay tuned for the next episodes in this webinar series. As I said, we will have one webinar per month and you can find all the upcoming episodes on our website and you can also follow us on social media where we always update you on any upcoming events. So I hope to see some of you in our upcoming episodes and thank you for joining today and I wish you all a nice rest of your day. Goodbye.